In the Epiphany season of light, this candle reminds us of God's light shining in the darkness. May we bear this light of hope, peace, and justice as a sign of Christ's spirit, Christ's spirit alive and at work in our world. Come, I invite you imaginatively to enter this sanctuary, this home of West Plains Church family. Bring your joys and be thankful. Bring your troubles and be trusting. Bring your hearts to share in God's love. Our opening hymn, All Beautiful, The March of Days. i 
Let us pray. God of majesty and mystery, we come before you in wonder and humility. Source of all that is, you are beyond our imagining, astonishing us with the detail and designs within your creation. Word of hope and healing, you touch our lives with truth and tenderness, revealing our need and our gift. Spirit of purpose and possibility, you move within us when we least expect it, awakening our gifts, urging us to respond. Receive our praise and prayer this day and prepare us to receive your word in its wisdom and warning. For we come to you through Christ our Lord, trusting in his grace and truth. Amen. Well, hello everyone and welcome to West Plains Online Worship for the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. My name is Philip Gardner. I'm joined virtually by my musician colleague, Leanne Tan, and her many fine singers. Once again, a big thank you goes to Peter and Marilyn Fox for managing the technical side of online worship at West Plains. I invite your continuing prayers for those in our church family who cope with COVID-19 on our behalf. So please remember, Margot and Emma, Lynn, Andrew, Diane, and Tara. We are as always grateful to many of you for the financial gifts that make their way here to support our community of faith's mission and ministry. If you're visiting online and would like some further information about giving or about other aspects of community life at West Plains, please check our website at www.westplains.ca. The opening of the United Church of Canada's 44th General Council takes place online this weekend. If you are interested in viewing any of the sessions via the internet, Google the United Church of Canada website where instructions will be provided. As a way of connecting the West Plains community with the work of the United Church General Council, the benediction that I'll offer at the end of online worship today is the benediction offered at the opening worship service of the 44th General Council. And now once again, let us pray. God, you are the source of wisdom and understanding for us. In the midst of all that distracts us, help us listen in stillness. In the midst of competing voices, may we hear your word for our lives and our times. By your spirit, help us discern Jesus' call to follow him. Amen. The first scripture reading today is Psalm 1. Blessed are those who do not follow the counsel of the wicked, or linger in the way of sinners, or sit down among those who mock. But their delight is in the law of God, and on, on that law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted beside streams of water, yielding their fruit in due season. Their leaves do not wither, and whatever they produce shall prosper. As for the wicked, it is not so with them, but they are like the chaff, driven away by the wind. Therefore the wicked shall not be able to stand when judgment comes, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For God watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The second scripture reading is Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 to 26. He, he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. 
and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe, is, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. For the word of God in Scripture among us and within us. Thanks be to God. The amusing story that I'm about to tell has been circulating for a while, so I was not surprised when a video version of it showed up in my email box a couple of weeks ago. At a country fair as the festivities began, a woman placed a large basket of shiny red apples on a table. She carefully designed and decorated a sign which she placed in front of her basket. The sign read, These apples are free to everyone, but take only one. God is watching you. A young boy named Jake happened by and studied both the sign and the apples with interest. He then spied a large platter of unattended chocolate chip cookies sitting on another table. Jake made his own sign, which he located near the cookies. His sign read, take all the chocolate chip cookies you want. God is watching the apples. Well, Jake might have benefited from today's gospel reading, which offers instruction about the woeful consequences of imagining that one can hoard either apples or chocolate chip cookies with impunity. Those gathered as Jesus began to preach were about to learn that it is the poor, not the rich, who are singled out for God's special caring attention. And indeed that wealth and the power that wealth wields can and almost does isolate the wealthy from God and from the rest of the human family. You make your way through Luke's gospel in its entirety, this is the theme that emerges again and again. Remember, for example, the revolutionary words of Mary's Magnificat, where Jesus' mother sings about the turning of the world that will come about with the new life stirring in her womb, a new life that in turn signals the arrival of the reign of God. Soon, sings Mary, the mighty will be toppled from their lofty thrones, while the lowly are lifted up. The hungry filled with good things, while the rich are sent away empty. Our gospel lesson today, the so-called Sermon on the Plain, continues to describe that topsy-turvy turning of the world that is part and parcel of the emerging reign of God that Mary's song describes. As Jesus speaks to us in the passage, we learn that many things that common sense and common custom tell us are in fact desirable, are not desirable at all. 
It will not be the successful, but the poor, the hungry, those who are hurting, those who mourn. These people are the ones who are lifted up and celebrated in God's realm. If you are thinking that Luke's Sermon on the Plain shares significant material with the Gospel of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, you are absolutely right. But there are some pretty interesting differences in the way that the two writers present their material. The list of blessings in Luke's version varies from Matthew's, both in number. Matthew has nine, while Luke has six and in content. Also radically different is the setting that each gospel writer chooses as the location for Jesus' important preaching about blessings. As they say in real estate, so in scripture study, location, location, location. When you're reading scripture, it's always good to ask yourself, where is the action happening in this particular passage? And why? Matthew's Jesus preaches his great sermon on a mountain, and that makes good spiritual sense. Mountains in the Bible are associated with calls, with revelation, and with the acquisition of wisdom. Moses goes up a mountain to meet God and to receive the law. Luke is similarly precise about the location for his offering of Jesus' sermon, but Luke makes a quite different choice. According to this gospel writer, Jesus has just descended from a mountain. The sermon happened, says Luke, on a level place. It is perhaps appropriate that my words at the moment are coming to you from a level place in our West Plains Sanctuary, and not from the more lofty pulpit location to my right, where I'm placed a few feet above contradiction. I quite like where I'm now standing, even though you may all be a distance away in location and in time. One of the cameras is centered directly in front of me. It helps me to feel that I'm still connected with you, and that's a good feeling. Some of this same desire for intimate connection might account for Jesus' move off the mountain and down to the plain. On this level place, Jesus found himself surrounded by a crowd, a great multitude of people from all over the ancient world. Luke tells us that there were Jews and Gentiles from Judea and Jerusalem, the coast of Tyre and Sidon. But given how sensitive Luke is to God's stated preference for the lowly and the poor, there's likely another level of meaning operated, operating in this choice of a plain rather than a mountain. Luke's Jesus comes down to the level place in order to make the point that Jesus' ministry is not obscure wisdom offered only to an elite few. Instead, his ministry is intended for ordinary people who are found in ordinary places. This is a man who will speak not only on the plain, he will speak plainly. And so he does. But this location on the plain also proves to be a place where people came to be healed of their diseases and where those who are troubled with unclean spirits are cured. If we use our imaginations, Luke offers a remarkable picture that swirls with motion, winds of the spirit and clouds of glory and dark shadows, all are shifting and moving and swirling about these human forms. People reached to touch Jesus, unclean spirits moved out of some of them, warmth and healing light moved into some of them, words hung in the air and then flashed into people's heads. And all the while Jesus stood in the midst of this turbulent sea of humanity. 
A power came out of him like a current, always moving toward those most in need. And as usual in Luke's gospel, Jesus' actions and his words prove to be closely interrelated, word and action always wrapped up together. I've spoken in the past about the so-called prosperity gospel movement of the great land to the south of us, a theology that regards the call to Christian discipleship as a call to a life of constant blessing and the piling up of material prosperity. Such prosperity is imagined to be God's appropriate reward for our good behavior. Well, the purveyors of this errant theological nonsense would be wise to pay attention and prayerful attention to what's going on here. Jesus' power came out from him and all who needed it were healed, not just some, not just the particularly deserving, all were healed. No personal moral effort was required on the part of those who longed to be made whole. This was a gracious divine offering, not a reward for goodness. Jesus' healing was a communal event. His love flew out to all those who needed it the most. In the midst of this scene, the 12, Jesus' inner circle of disciples, must have been in awe of the crowds and of the energy in the air. It was at this point that Jesus looked up at his disciples, not at the crowd, but at the disciples, and he began to say some strange, some topsy-turvy things. Had we been present, we might have expected him to say, blessed are the ones who come to me to be made whole and clean, but Jesus doesn't say that. In fact, he doesn't really even talk about the multitude. His gaze is so fixed on his 12 followers. In an instant, Jesus shifts from his role as a miracle worker, worker and enters into prophetic mode. He names urgent truth and calls people to embrace the unexpected for the sake of the very old and very new reign of God a reign of shalom that is to be fulfilled on earth as it is in heaven. And what does he say? Blessed are you who are poor. Not poor in spirit, as Matthew offers it. Luke's Jesus says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who weep and mourn. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude and revile you. Then having declared who it is that is blessed using verbs in the present tense, Jesus shifts to a balancing series of warnings or woes that are expressed in the future tense. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Most of the Sermon on the Plain material was likely a tough sell for those listening to Jesus 2,000 years ago, but it's equally challenging, I think, for us. The words may be hard to comprehend for those Christians who have rarely, if ever, known what it is to be in want, in pain, or to be reviled and excluded. It's a very different story, however, for those who have whether among, among black or white, newcomer or native born, male or female, straight or LGBTQ2S, when Jesus says, blessed are you who now find yourselves hungry or persecuted, there are a few statements that resound as powerfully 
through the intervening centuries. Jesus' words are bold and instructional, and they are preparatory. They call for a new way of looking at life and faith, a new life that asks us to give up the old. It includes giving up the notion that our true home is with those folk who are doing really well, or to assume that doing really well means that God is on our side. Instead, Jesus cautions his disciples. Prosperity can be a sweet poison. It can cause us to forget not only our personhood, but our connectedness with the whole village, indeed with the whole web of created life. And if we choose to pursue only our own personal well-being, then woe to us. Prosperity and the world's good opinion can equally and easily blind us. The world often rewards achievers or those who say the things that people want to hear. But if we rejoice in our own freedom from suffering while we forget the suffering of others, then we're in grave spiritual danger, says Jesus. And God help us if we invoke God's power and Christ's name to wage war on those people who are not like us. If they were paying attention, Jesus' words would also have reminded his disciples of Jesus' own experience of rejection at Nazareth. If you follow me, he's saying, and walk in my way and live my life as I'm asking you to do, then you will undoubtedly be hated, excluded, reviled, and defamed, maybe even killed. But watch me, walk with me, come with me, for God will enable you to endure the agony as healing takes place, as lives are reshaped, and as the new creation groans its way into being. In other words, the lesson offered by these blessings and woes is that God in Jesus sees the world in a strikingly different way from the way that we see it. The real world for those who are in Christ is one in which most of the major status roles of life are utterly reversed. Blessed are the poor, the hungry, the grieving. Jesus also makes it clear that while he issues a call to the disciples and us to position ourselves on a level place in the midst of suffering humanity, this call to stand amid the brokenness is issued not only for the sake of those who are in need, but also for our own hope and our salvation. We are all beloved of God, and each one of us is entitled to be a part of that scene on the plain. Those of us who are warm and those of us who need to be invited out of the cold. Good churchy people and not so good churchy people. Those who beg and those who are billionaires, we are all called to position ourselves on that level place in the midst of the winds of the spirit and the clouds of glory and the dark shadows. We are all invited to stand in solidarity with him, with Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.
Let us pray. God, you are the source of our lives. From you, all loving kindness, justice, and mercy flow. Bless the gifts that we offer so that acts of kindness, justice, and mercy may flow through them too. And bless our lives so our words and actions show your spirit at work in us and through us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our friend and savior. Amen. Throughout this season of Epiphany, we've been following the pastoral prayer with a paraphrase of the prayer of Jesus, found on page 916 of Voices United. Let us now gather our hearts and minds in prayer. God of mystery and mercy, we come before you today carrying hopes and dreams, the burdens and blessings of our lives. We bring all that is in our hearts and minds to you, seeking your comfort and strength, listening for your guidance, grateful that you hear us when we pray. 
God of life and love, we give you thanks that you engage us whenever we need you in the midst of challenge and uncertainty. We pray today for all those who are fearful about their future and for all who wrestle with challenges at work or at home. Help us to face our fears and our challenges sure of your steadfast love. God of hope and healing in Jesus Christ, you confronted demons that trouble our minds and the pain and illness which can weigh us down. We pray today for all those who are facing health concerns and for all who care for the suffering or for those in need of support. Surround each one with your steadfast love. In our own community at this time, we pray for Liz, Marnie, Haley, Tyson, Joan and Bernie, Lawrence and Tilly, Sylvia and Madge. God of peace and promise, when we wrestle with any burdens, your spirit prays within us with sighs too deep for words. Today we pray for all those whose burdens seem too heavy to bear, for the victims of violence or disaster, for their friends and families. For refugees at risk in so many places in the world and those making a new home in our community. For those caught in despair and poverty in our own neighborhoods and in the forgotten corners of your world. We pray for those in our nation elected to the difficult task of governing during this time of deep division, anxiety, unrest, and deliberate provocation. Holy Presence, receive all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and equip us to do your will as together we offer a paraphrase of the prayer that Jesus taught us. Eternal Spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings, your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Our concluding hymn, O Sing to Our God. Señor, un cántico nuevo, cantar, Señor, un cántico nuevo. 
Be brave, beloved. May you enter free fall into the blessing of the three times holy. As you fall, call out the name, then listen as the warm, dark silence echoes it back to you in your own cradle tongue. The sound shattered, refracted into a rainbow of names that call forth a sigh of recognition a groan, a glimmer, a magnificent magnificat, nameless and naming and named. Be bold, beloved. With Hagar, name the one who knows you. With Moses, accept the name in the fire that does not destroy. With the disciples, take the question and bear it, its blessing and its cost. Who do you say? that I am. Be bolder, braver yet, beloved, and receive this blessing, the blessing of the naming of evil. Left unnamed, it names us, tells us who we are and what we're worth. Name the evil, call out to it that there is a name stronger, more expansive, and free before which there is no other. Be blessed, beloved, be blessed to be a blessing. Together, connected in the name of love, wade through the river. We are hip deep in glory, awash in hope. Be bold, be brave, be blessed. Amen.